We're reading Wren, and today we're on chapter 11, The Menagerie Grows. There were several additions to the Kalilili Menagerie that spring. Two cats, a canary, and of all things, a mother and father Wren who built a house in the feeding station in the large tree outside the kitchen window. The cats arrived first. Shanty loved them from the start. They were a present from the Balfs, friends of Mommy and Daddy's. Mom Pum said the Balfs were very intelligent since they appreciated and understood cats. They presented the Kalilalis with two Maine Coon cats. The cats have a long, rich, silky coat, very much like a combination Persian and Angora. They were first brought to Maine by seamen on the vessels coming from the Orient. Due to the cold climate, the, cla the cats flourished in Maine. The male, the Kalilalis named Sandy McTavish, he looked so like a debonair Scotsman. Marie and Wren did a lot of arguing over what they should call the female. Mom Pom listened to their wrangling for several days and decided to settle the matter herself and restore peace. I shall name the cat, she told them. Henceforth, she shall be called Anonymous. That's a queer name, Marie was puzzled. What does it mean, Wren wanted to know. You should call her Nani for short. It means bearing no name. That's cute, said Wren, and it gives me a new word for my vocabulary. The next time I'm naughty and you ask me who did the mischievous thing, I shall say anonymous, but I won't mean the cat. I like it, said Marie. That's fine, Mommy told them. Then there'll be no more arguing. The next arrival was a bird, a canary. It was no problem to know what to call him. In a manner of speaking, he named himself. The first day they had him, he ducked his head and almost bent himself in half to get in his to get into his water cup and take a bath. So they called him Dunk. He was not timid and the noisier the house, the better he liked it. His feathers were a rich yellow, fading out to a paler, paler yellow at the tips of his wings. At the end of two weeks, he was eating off their fingers and pretending to fight with them. They would put his cage on the table after dinner and take turns fighting. Wren would go first. She would move her face up slowly to the side of the cage, making a furry, a furry sound and then moving her head slowly from side to side. Dunk would hunch his head down between his shoulders, spread his wings, open his beak and attack. Wren would move her head around and he would follow from perch to perch, making little make-believe angry noises. Then she'd hold still with her nose between the bars and he would assault her, pecking her nose and scolding at the same time, but it never really hurt. They had a little trouble with Shanty the first day or two after the canary came. When Dunk started to sing, his voice was angelic. Shanty would stand still and point. He would look like a statue, his head slightly lowered, his right forepaw up, his tail straight up behind. Let me show you. Daddy took a firm hand with Shanty, not knowing what might follow his point. It was natural that a dog should do this, since Irish setters have been trained for many generations to hunt birds. After a while, Dunk would try to fight with Shanty, but somehow Shanty never got the hang of the game. He'd sniff, lick the cage, set it swinging, and then walk away. The whole family had to take a firm hand with Sandy McTavish and Nani, too. It was more than a month before the cats stopped stalking Dunk and licking their chops when they passed his cage. Then came the wrens. Because of Karen's nickname, they were of special interest. The children watched them set up housekeeping. The father wren seemed to do all the work. The mother wren was busy too, but not working. She followed her mate around to make sure he did a good job. And she coaxed and scolded and talked the whole time. Daddy said the male was wren picked. This busy male wren picked up sticks and bits of grass and pieces of string that mom pom put in the lawn and carried them back to the nest. In the evening, when their day's work was done, the friendly birds would follow whoever was out in the yard. They'd flit from tree to tree and carry on a conversation. At the same time, during every evening, they gave a concert. Daddy said, if there's anything sweeter than the song of a wren, I don't know what it is. One morning, Daddy started off for his train. A few minutes later, he came hurrying into the house. Quick, he picked up Karen. Everybody out in the yard, we have baby wrens. They all rushed out and stood under the feeder turned birdhouse. Listen now, said Daddy. They stood quietly and they listened. Soon they heard little tiny thin peepings. The mother bird flew out and in and a few minutes was back with something in her mouth. She flew into the babies and the peepings grew louder as they demanded their breakfast. Oh, I can't wait to see them, said Marie. Neither can I. Wren was staring at the wren's house as though she could see through the wooden walls. 
I'm going to be late for work. Daddy handed red to mommy and he dashed down the hill. One evening, about three weeks later, the family went out to listen to the baby wrens. As they stood beside the tree, Mom Pom said, I hope everything's all right. I haven't heard the big one since yesterday morning. Daddy looked startled. They whistled and called, but the mother and father birds were nowhere to be seen. They stood a long time listening for the chirpings of the little ones. There was no sound. Daddy said, something's wrong. He fetched a ladder and put it against the tree. He climbed up to the birdhouse. Wren kept looking all around, hoping the mother and father would come back. Daddy put his ears against the hole in the front of the house and listened. He shook his head. Very carefully and very slowly, he put his finger in the hole and moved it around inside. He took it up out just as slowly and came down the ladder. He looked upset. The little ones are in there, he told the anxious watchers, but I'm afraid something's happened to the mother and father. I'm not sure the little ones are alive. Oh no, Karen wailed. What shall we do? Take them out, Daddy, Marie suggested. Maybe we can help them. Gloria came up the hill just then and they told her of the tragedy. Oh, do take them out, she begged. Maybe we can save the little ones. All right, Daddy said, I'll try. He went for a big pair of shears and climbed back up the ladder. He cut the rope and handed the birdhouse to Mummy. She steadied it while he worked the nails out and took the front off. There inside were six tiny birds. They were very still. Wren put her finger tenderly on top of one. Oh, Mom Pom, he's cold. And she started to cry. Mom Pom touched the baby wrens one after another. I'm afraid they're dead, she said in a low voice. There must be something we can do. Marie was crying now. Let me think, said Mummy. She thought and she thought. Well, I can try, she said to herself and turned to Daddy. Bring the birdhouse into the kitchen, she said. She picked up Karen and went indoors, followed by all the others. Daddy put the house on the kitchen table. Mummy went over and lit the gas stove oven on a low heat. Then she went to the closet for a pie tin. She went to the birdhouse and took all the babies, nest and all. She put them on the pie tin and put the tin in the oven, leaving the door open. The family sat on the floor in front of it. They sat quite a long time, watching and waiting, and then suddenly one of the tiny creatures moved its head. They held their breaths. After a little, another moved, and then another. An hour later, five baby wrens had revived. The sixth they put in a cardboard box that Mummy's earrings had come in, that's how tiny it was, and buried him in the yard. They had a funeral procession and sang Brahms lullaby very softly and sadly. Then they put some dandelions on the grave and went back in the house. Marie and Gloria made a new nest for the others of cotton in a cup. They put the five baby birds in it and covered them over except for their heads. However, are we going to feed them? Mommy asked Daddy. I wish I knew, he told her anxiously. Let me think, said Mom Pom for the second time. She walked up and down the kitchen thinking. They'll die if I don't think of something soon, she murmured to herself. The children sat quietly so they wouldn't interrupt her thinking. She murmured some more then, I'll try it, she exclaimed. If, they, if I don't, they'll die anyway. Mommy hurried upstairs and came back with a pair of eyebrow tweezers. She put some milk on the stove to heat and she took out a box of pablum. She broke an egg into a bowl. She beat the egg and dropped one vi drop of vitamin oil, then some pablum and some warm milk and beat the mixture well. With tweezers, she picked up a mite of the mixture and she carried it over to the birds. First, she tapped a little beak. Nothing happened. It stayed tight shut. She tapped it lightly again, and then the beak flew open, and the wee one made a faint chirp. His mouth is so big, Marie exclaimed. It's about as big as all the rest of them. It's enormous, Karen agreed. Meanwhile, Mom Pom was working with the mixture off the tweezer on the inside of the beak. The beak closed, and they all waited anxiously. The baby moved his head a little, opened his beak a fraction, moved his tongue, and swallowed. They waited. Mommy put some more of the mixture on the tweezer and tapped the beak again. It opened and she put some food in the hungry mouth. Again, the bird swallowed it. He's eating, he's eating, he's ravenous. He's gonna live, Wren fairly yelled in her relief. You can't be sure, Daddy tried to keep her from getting too happy. He didn't want her to be too disappointed. I'm sure they'll all live, said Wren. She had no doubts. We all hope so, said Gloria, but it'll take several days before we know for sure. May I feed them, Mom Pom? Marie asked. You all have turns tomorrow, Mom Pom promised, but tonight I think I better do it. I think they haven't eaten in a day or more, Daddy said, as he watched the beaks open hungrily, one after another. Oh, my hat! What's the matter, Mommy asked. Did I do something wrong? No, Daddy told her. What you're doing is right, but I just thought of how often you're going to have to do it. I've already thought of it. Mommy didn't look bothered. They're going to have to be fed every two hours, day and night, until they get their strength back. How in the world are we going to manage that? Daddy asked. 
Just the way we did with the children in the night bottles, Mom Pom said calmly. We'll take turns. Who'll take turns? Daddy asked suspiciously. The children can't get up at night. No, darling, Mommy smiled sweetly, but you and I can. Daddy looked horrified. Taking shifts to feed a baby is one thing. You know I enjoyed that, but shifts for feeding birds is something else again. He looked around to find one sympathetic face. No one said a word or looked in the least sympathetic. He began to feel uncomfortable. After all, he went on rather weakly, I have to go to work. And, and he was now appealing to Ren and Gloria and Marie. They looked a little shocked, as though he were failing them. He cleared his throat. They continued to stare at him. Oh, well, he said with a joy, a bit of, in a voice of forced joy, it'll really be fun and it won't be for long. Daddy, you're a darling, said Ren. I knew you'd do it, Marie told him, and ran over and kissed him. So did I, said Mummy, and she went over and turned off the oven. Here's another picture. <laughs>